asked me uh, to uh, tell everyone that we're going to try to get a group picture at the end outside uh, after uh, the English uh, presentation. Uh, so please come on for, for a few minutes outside uh, after, um, uh, after the talk. So someone asked me uh, yesterday who Vindic was, and I told them that they will distinguish him very easily uh, by his uh, uh, stature. He's uh, not only distinguished by his uh, physical uh, attributes and, and, and height, but also by his intellectual height. He's, he's uh, really uh, uh, an amazing candidate. And you, you got a, a very brief glimpse of, uh, of his work from March uh, the other day, when she introduced uh, uh, a lot of the beautiful work that he's uh, been doing and he will uh, tell us about uh, 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 today. And as Marsh said, a lot of the hard questions that you didn't get the other day, uh, we'll, we'll get all the answers to that. So, Cedric. Okay, thanks so much, Gabriel, for the great kind of direction. Um, yeah, so that might spy in here, so I know a little bit what, what you guys have been exposed to in the last couple uh, days, and uh, I'll try to make some connections, um, but I'll probably skip over some parts if you've already heard about those. Um, so I came in yesterday and I was actually getting pretty sentimental. I was taking the sister course of this one 22 years ago. Uh, and for me, it was really like a... You can't hear me? I can hear myself through the speakers here, but you can't. <laughs> Is this better? Better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, I, I took this course and oh, when I'm sending it, it's louder or... Is it just me that I hear it? Okay. Um, not good? I don't know. Can you crank it a little bit? A little bit more. Yeah. Okay, so how's this? Still not better? Maybe you can come closer then. <laughs> you having fun? <laughs> oh, you're fine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, okay, so I, I took this course in uh, methods and computational neuroscience. It was really like a life-changing experience. And uh, one of the interesting things was just yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine who actually met at this course for the first time about doing sabbatical in my lab. So there are lots of things that you can get away from uh, these courses, and I hope you're going to have a uh, similarly good experience with the course that you're taking um, aside with the one that I took. Um, email came out from Tommy yesterday saying that we shouldn't be lecturing you guys so much but give you problems to solve, I guess because you're taking a course in intelligence, you should prove your own, or you want to prove your own. So um, I thought maybe I'll start out with a couple of problems. Um, so first question that I would have for you, what, if anything, does face recognition have to do with intelligence? Did anyone tell you that? I am actually not going to tell you that, but uh, maybe you, you know the answer to that question. No, no one knows what the relation might be. I don't know either. Okay. Um, so another problem. So why are there face selective cells? Did anyone tell you that? I mean, it's an observation that there are cells that are face selective, but <clears throat> like, like, why would there be such a thing as a face selective cell? Well, I mean, it's just Okay, but maybe you could also do this with just like a broad code of lower level things. Um, it's a stimulus of reoccurring consistent statistics given how social we are. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, if you have cells that are sensitive to reoccurring statistics, you might just get things. Can you speak louder? Right, oh, sorry, yeah. So um, faces are a stimulus that have um, common statistics that reoccur over time um, very consistently given that we're such social animals. So if you have cells that are sensitive to repeated statistics, then you might get things that just specialize for. Okay. Solving face recognition would be a different problem than solving generic object recognition. You could use the machinery for that. So it's like not <coughs> face selective in the sense that the scope of the cell is faces. But like calling it just face selective may not like you do that much of the story of what it's actually computing. Okay. Everyone, okay. All right, good. so we get like three possible answers to the problem. So why might they be say selective areas? Which Nancy discovered, and uh, maybe she told you why she thinks that there are such things as face areas. It's a weird thing, right? Okay. Well, we heard something about um, 
about how you need um, anatomical uh, closeness to get expert performance. Um, so we were, we were told that. Okay. Thank you. If these like these cells need to be connected to each other to some extent, or connected by other cells that connect them, um, it's possible that having them close together can optimize wiring length. Right. Okay. Good. And another problem. Um, so how can we figure out how phase cells work? Um, and that's maybe something that okay, maybe you have some ideas you can tell me. So, uh, so it's maybe like a like a question you can think about as I go through my my talk. Um, but I think it's a very um, it's a very fundamental question that we have to answer. It's like how it's a phenomenon that these cells exist, but how do they actually wire it up to gain the properties that they have? And um, uh, this question I brought up because uh, Jim DiCarlo was speaking before, and um, and March was speaking before. And I don't know if you guys noticed that there are different attitudes and different kind of approaches to uh, to studying object recognition. Was was that highlighted to you, or no? Okay, so maybe I'll. Um, okay, so I don't know exactly what they told you, but uh, my uh, my hunch is going to be that um, so Jim's approach is to to characterize what a cell is doing and then look at lots of cells and see what the population code might convey. And so the approach that Marge is taking, but I don't know if she told talk to you about this, and it's also the approach that we've been taking mostly, um, in addition to some population decoding um, results, we to analyze why a cell might be responding to a stimulus the way it does. Um, and these are like two very fundamentally very different ways of looking at the problem. So um, I just wanted to highlight this from, from the outset. Okay, so here's, okay, this used to work. Uh, so this is the problem that we're interested in in the lab, or it's one of the problems we're interested in the lab. Um, so these are Tonkin macaque monkeys, which are very similar to the macaque monkeys that we study, the rhesus monkeys. You can see that they're very social and in different ways that you can immediately recognize. Even if you're not familiar with these monkeys, you know, you can sort of understand what, what they're doing. It's kind of like a story, you know, like a big male monkey probably chasing like a younger monkey or a female sitting there. And um, so basically we try to understand what's going on and what is going on in the brain as they are processing these social scenes and how they can understand them. Um, the second part shows the good use of, uh, of tool use. So there are two basic theories about the evolution of primate intelligence. One has to do with the, uh, social, with the pressures of living in social groups. The other one has to do with tool use. And if you figure out how you can use the stick to clean your nose, then you're probably a pretty intelligent animal. So the... Uh, so the cool thing about uh, primates is that they're not only social, but they know a lot about their social environment. And that sets them apart from other social animals. It's one thing to be social, you know, like being cuddly with others, um, but the other thing is to know exactly what's going on there. And um, there's one tale to illustrate this. Um, uh, this is the story of Ala. So Ala was a female uh, baboon. And in Southwest Africa, some farmers had the habit of uh, actually using baboons as herding animals. So they would basically replace the dogs with uh, with the boots. And uh, so Ala was uh, captured at age two, and um, she would basically herd uh, goats. You can see her here. She would adapt some of the behaviors that the goats had. So this is like a, it's a little hard to see, um, but there are a couple of goats here. There's a, a salt place here, and she starts licking this, the salt stone, which is something that the boons would naturally not do, but the, but the goats would do. But she would also retain some of the very uh, typical behaviors that the boons are engaged and so she would basically groom uh, these goats as you might see here and, and here and um, but the most amazing thing that she did and it's a little hard or very hard to see here is that at the end of the day when she was done herding these animals on the outside and would be brought back to the stables and the farmers would engage in this behavior that they would uh, separate the adults uh, from the um, from the uh, the young kids and uh, Ala would basically uh, manically try to pair up again, uh, correspondingly the mother animal with her offspring. And she would even do this as long as the farmers, if a, a mother had like three offspring, she would like to, they would like to separate them to distribute them more evenly across, uh, across female uh, animals. And Ala would, would not have this, so she would really put like all these three offsprings uh, to the mother animals. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, so this is something that the farmers would not have been able to do themselves. They would not be able to tell which goat is this which. Uh, they would not know what the pairing was, uh, but Allah was really knowing this uh, very precisely. 
So one conclusion that we can draw from this is that primates not only behave socially, but they have social knowledge. And basically, this knowledge can be grouped into three uh, categories. So most basically, they have knowledge of other individuals that they know. And that's, again, something that's not clear if rodents have this, uh, for example. Um, so they know the age of, the, of their peers, like if it's a juvenile or an adult, they know the gender, female or male. Uh, the second level of understanding is about the interactions, and that's also a focus in the, uh, in the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines to understand how the brain can recognize these uh, different interactions that can take place. So it's like grooming behavior, for example, mothering behavior. These are interactions that can take place between two animals. And um, if, it, if you can understand this concept, it means somehow you have to be able to recognize it. Uh, and they understand the relationships between individuals. So they understand things like friendship, kinship, or hierarchy. And uh, to me, this is pretty amazing because if you can represent hierarchy, it means that you have to have a very elaborate uh, data structure in your brain somewhere uh, that is uh, it's not associative simply, but it has a direction to it. If you know that A is the mother of B, it means that you know that B is not the mother of A. So, it's, so there's a relationship, um, a direction uh, to it. And all of this is rooted in the person concept. So primates have the concept of a, of a person in which they group the information they have about others uh, which they know. Uh, so this would be like one person, the juvenile, female, the daughter of X, and all this knowledge would be stored in one compact format. And we have currently absolutely no idea how this is done in the brain. But the nice thing about this person concept is that we can get to it uh, through one stimulus that we can understand pretty well, that we already understand a bit about, and that's the face. Mm -hmm. is, I mean, is it, is it, they know about like right? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not just agents, right? Hmm? I mean, do they, they know that people are different than, than other uh, other monkeys or whatever? Right? Say, I don't hear the. Do, do they interact with the experimenter differently than, than they do? With ah, okay. So, so these observations are are from the wild, um, but but there are some behavioral studies from conspecifics that they would uh, would know uh, conspecifics it's individuals. From your interaction with the animals, you would assume that they would have a person concept of you as well. Yeah, but the example of shows that if you have this cognitive structure, right, you're trying to impose it on whatever environment you're living in. So if you're living with goats, then you're, you know, this is going to become your group, and then you're going to apply these to the structures to uh, the structures to the goats. Okay, so so the primate phase is also very special. Um, so they are, um, the primates are expressing their emotions, otherwise private internal states uh, through the face. So Darwin famously noticed this in 1872. Um, so you can see a facial expression again of a Tonkin macaque. And you can elicit something like an expression electrically in the facial musculature, but it can also be conveyed by the body posture. And uh, you saw a little bit of this in the movie that I showed initially, right? As, the, uh, as one monkey was chasing the other, there were sort of these displays of teeth uh, in between, so there were definitely emotions involved in that, and then they would be displayed at the face. And that's very um, something that not all animals can do. So if you're a fish or a frog, you know, you can do lots of things, and even very cool things like sitting on a pouch and on a porch, and you know and enjoy life, uh, but there are certain things that you cannot do, and that is, you know, change your facial structure. So that's something that's very typical of mammals. You can see a video from uh, Michael Brecht's group. Uh, from the top, you might not see the whiskers. Um, so these, these rats are encountering each other, and they, they touch uh, themselves by, by whisking against each other. And the reason they can do this is that they are very fine muscles in the face that are attached directly to the skin, or in this case, to the whiskers, and therefore the facial configuration can be changed. And uh, so this allows primates in, uh, in particular with some uh, 24 muscles that are very similar across different uh, primate species uh, to signal their internal emotional states to the face. Okay, so in primates are also very interested in faces. I always like to show this movie here. It's a three-day-old macaque monkey and you can see it's already very interested in other faces. And uh, after some time, there's going to be some kind of facial mimicking behavior. So the experimenter is going to move his mouth and then the, uh, the, uh, the little uh, critter here is going to move his mouth too. Uh, the other thing I use this movie too is to illustrate like how we are spending a lot of time during the day watching faces. Like what you're doing now is what you're doing a lot of time during the day, like watching and analyzing other faces. Okay, so here it goes. He's um, moving his mouth. And after some inspection, there is some facial movement uh, here as well. And that ability to mimic the facial movement, this is something that's uh, very specific, happens early in life. In the cat monkeys, is only there for two, three weeks, and it goes away. It's a very strong predictor of the future cognitive ability. So the more they engage in this mimicking behavior, uh, the better their uh, cognitive and, and motor behaviors later on. 
Uh, the third reason why I'd like to show this is that um, I see a lot of smiles on, on faces here in the audience. Um, so as you're watching this little very cute critter, I got into your emotional brain. You have a very strong emotional reaction, hopefully. Uh, all of you have seen this now a couple hundred times, this movie, and every time I find this very endearing. Um, so, so faces also have the way to get uh, activity emotions very easily. So the consequence of us looking at faces uh, very frequently, we're also very good looking at faces. This is a demonstration from Pavan Zinner from some 10 years ago. You recognize, even though these are blurred images, famous individuals who you know very easily. It's also an illustration that there's something about face recognition that is uh, holistic, that you don't need great detail to recognize the face if there's something about the gist of the face that allows you to recognize them uh, very easily. Okay, so uh, social perception really can rely on many, many, yeah? Does that work? Like, it seems like just I'm using a lot of like the edges of the faces and your hair and like, the shoulders. Like, if Bill Clinton weren't wearing a jacket, I'm not sure I would recognize yeah. Bill Clinton. Okay, like, so I think the like, question... Would it, just, would it just work if you just had the face with no hair, with no external cues? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question is whether you can do the same thing if you're taking away all the external clues. Um, like even the glasses of Woody Allen, yeah. it's going to make it harder. Uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure this has been, I don't know if Nancy knows, uh, I don't know if this has been formally done. Um, without hair, I think it would be harder. Um, I think Nixon you could recognize, you know, by, by the facial outline still. Um, yeah, Bill Clinton, I think, would be doing well, but it, hmm? it doesn't feel like it's about patients per se. It doesn't feel like a face per se. Yeah. If you could adjust, if you imagine plotting out all of the internal face features, you wouldn't be able to recognize. I feel like it would do that better than cutting off that everything else. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to even recognize full resolution faces without hair, though, right? I don't know. I feel like it's relatively easy. Yeah. other stuff we need to control yeah. for with faces, but I think it's just a key part of what we use in face recognition. It's not the only cue, but it's an important cue. Yeah. So actually, March was here. I remember when I was in the lab, she changed her, her hair style and her color, and she reported afterwards that people got really mad at her for, for doing that because it made it harder for it to be recognized. Mm -hmm. So it's an important clue, but yeah, one that you can change. And computer vision, the history of face identification started with work by Takeo Kanade, um, and the system there was to detect uh, features like eyes and mouth and nose, which he did by hand, because computers did not manage to do it at the time, and then use the geometry, the relative distance of eyes and mouth and nose to infer identity. Now, it turns out that if you do even grade level correlation after um, some normalization, you get much better results than using features. Especially if you do correlation of parts of the face, like the part that contains the eyes and separately the part that contains the mouth. You, you need just pixel-based correlation pixel -based. rather so than intermediate yeah. to that. So the yeah. features are much less, the geometry of the features which is used in police across the world, yeah. it is not as telling as just template matching the search. It makes sense, right? Because um, like one of the core of our space recognition ability is to use the configural effect, like the spacing between the right. features rather than the features. Because the features are really, really similar across different people, even gender and race. So I assume it's more like the spacing between the features that are more... Yeah, so some of the information would be preserved. Even yeah. if you extract those as yeah. features, it doesn't do that well. Yeah. Suggesting there's the low-level information is carrying a lot. There's also probably a lot of information contained in the fact that, given this presentation, that you have to kill the people, that there are probably famous people on this slide here, right? Yeah. So, I mean, how old would it work if you just like, took like a took some random person, took their Facebook, grabbed some like pictures of their friends, and did this right. test here, right? That's right. It would be much harder. You think about like just the faces. I mean, so you have no hair at all, right? And uh, you just put up uh, a pair of glasses and, and a big cigar. You might say, or oh, a, a grease paint mustache. You say, oh, that's Groucho Marx or something. Right? You don't need to use the other side, like the objects. It's like the Woody Allen, the eyes, glasses really mean a lot. I guess even the mustaches themselves are 
uh, more informative in a lot of things. That, that is, is that still on the same, by the way? Yeah. Okay, good. Then, yeah. yeah, that's because oh. these people have already deceased in the meantime. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, what do you have on that? All right, so uh, but from the face, the face is the most important source of social information. Uh, so you get things like gender, age, personal identity, even things like trustworthiness and attractiveness, just some very brief exposures. Um, and you can get like changeable features like the mood of the person from the face expression uh, and the overall direction of attention to where the person is looking to. So it's a very rich source of information, and that's in part why maybe faces are treated separately from other objects, um, because they're so important, and might be wired up differently than other uh, high-level shapes like this neurons. Okay, so for you to use this uh, social information, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of computational problems you have to solve first. Uh, so the first thing is you have to know where the faces are. Uh, once you know what the faces are, then you can apply your you know, high-level recognition algorithms and you can try to extract the mood of the person or identity of the, um, of the face. And it's not a trivial problem at all. Um, so if you think about it, if you see like all these images here, right? Like we can see the same identity in these two images here. Um, even though at a low level, these two images are much more similar to each other. And uh, so one of the questions is like, like, why does the brain do this in, you know, automatically and how does it do that? Okay, so some, something can go wrong. Um, so there's about like 1% of the general population that suffers from a condition known as prosopagnosia or face blindness. And to prosopagnosics, the social world might look something like this. Um, so that virtually all the faces look identical to each other. And when this happens, you can imagine that now your enthusiasm about you know, processing the social environment is very much curbed. Um, so the, the question then is like, what, what's going wrong? And I don't think we have like a very good explanation right now still like what's going wrong in, in, in prosopagnosia. So when I was a postdoc in Nancy's lab, we had like a very sweet uh, prosopagnosic there that we were looking at uh, for any differences in face recognition, any markers that we had didn't turn out anything drastic. So there was an M170, like a face selective component, and uh, everything sort of physiologically seemed, seems pretty normal. And uh, so all the differences that we're talking about between prosopagnosics and, uh, and neurotypicals are very, very small differences. Okay, so. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah, so most. Yeah, so most prosopagnosics can recognize that there's a face, so they can detect faces, but they can't tell one face from another. So they would know that there are lots of faces here, um, but they wouldn't really know. Well, in this case, they, they might know uh, yeah. uh, if, if there were different people there than uh, who it was. So there are other cases where, yeah, so it could be like selective face expressions that are impaired. It could be even the ability to detect a face could be impaired. But the typical case is that you can't tell one person from another. Okay, so these are like all the different uh, clues you might get from a, from a face. And uh, the point I want to make here is that um, it, I think beyond face recognition, we have to look for the networks that face recognition is then feeding into because you have these emotional responses to faces. You activate your memory, you see this picture here, he knows Charles Darwin. It's not just a face, it's not just a specific face, but a face you know and you have knowledge about and you're activating your knowledge about this person automatically. Faces draw attention when the face pops up in an environment, your attention is drawn to it immediately or directed in the direction of the gaze of the face as shown here. Uh, and you're eliciting some motor responses as I showed to you with, the, uh, with this baby monkey initially. Okay. So there are some early models about how this might work in the, in the human brain. I don't know, Nancy might have talked about this. There was this idea early on brought forward by, by Bruce and Young uh, some 30 years ago um, that there is a distribution of functions, so that there might be different parts of the brain. Uh, this is based mostly on lesion studies in humans uh, that would process different kinds of faces. So some part maybe for dynamical face information, others for identity information. And that then these would feed into other modules that would do like high level, more high level cognitive uh, processing. Okay, the new basis of face recognition, I don't know, did March talk about this already, or Nancy? So uh, this is Charles Gross. Um, he was actually the, the first person to record from face selective cells. And this was in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, this is the side view of the macaque brain that I'm going to be using for most part of my talk. The temporal lobe is known to be important for object recognition, mostly the ventral portion of your temporal cortex. And so he would record from cells um, in this region and then present stimuli like a, like a monkey face or a biological control object like a hand or a scrambled version of a face. And he would find cells like this one here that selectively increase their response rate if he shows a picture of a face. You can see the action potentials here. 
increase when you show the face and don't increase when you show the hand. And uh, we did some control. So this particular cell you know, responds both to the monkey face and the human face. And if you take the eyes out, the response is a little bit weaker. If you show pumpkin face, there's still a response, but it's weaker. If you just show some bars there, there's no response. Again, no response to the hand, also not to the scam, <coughs> and so on and so forth. The problem uh, was actually, yeah, so I should mention this. So, uh, so Charles Cross was very much influenced by the work of uh, Hubel and Wiesel, who studied early visual processing. I don't know if anyone has covered this, uh, this here in the approach. And also by this guy here uh, at the bottom, Jerry Ledwin. And uh, he actually coined this term grandmother neuron. I don't know if uh, Gabriel mentioned this, anyone has mentioned this before. So, it's a, so the idea that he put forward is that maybe in your brain you have like a neuron that's firing exactly when you see a grandmother and only when you see your grandmother. And so this was the idea of a grandmother neuron, that there's like a very, very high level, very sparse representation that is very selective for a particular uh, a concept. And then he basically invented this whole story about like a person who has like several grandmother cells and then some neurosurgeon takes out these particular neurons and then afterwards the person doesn't recognize his, uh, his grandmother anymore. And uh, I mentioned this to illustrate that the, that the study of face cells ever since the discovery and even before the discovery of face like these neurons has really been very important in, uh, in theories about how the brain works. Uh, so there have been concepts like uh, Konorsky's, uh, for example, that did advocate the, the fact that there are representations that are very, very sparse on very high level, like the grandmother neuron. And uh, Horace Barlow talked about pontifical cells. So he met, uh, mentioned that there was a hierarchy of processing at the top of which you would have very few uh, cells that are highly, highly selective to one particular object concept. And that the firing of these cells would be like a one-to-one -one correspondence to your subjective experience of seeing that particular object. And then there are other theories like Lashley, who talked about mass, mass action and maybe even a hologram, and Donald Hebb, who talked about cell assemblies. And uh, so these were like vastly different uh, concepts about how the brain might be working in very sparse, very selective units uh, versus very coarse, very broad distributions. And I think that's still an open question in the field, even though we know that face cells exist, which of these schemes is true, or is it really the dichotomy, or are both schemes going on? So the first problem I gave to you, like why face cells exist actually, uh, as a pointer to this debate, um, because you could imagine, at least Donald Hepp and Carl Lesley could imagine that you can perfectly well recognize a face without having any face selective neurons at all. You would just do it by sampling over hundreds of thousands or millions of cells with some selectivity, and by the joint activity, just like we were before in the hippocampus, you could, in this case, not decode where you are, but you could decode what you're seeing. And you might not need this very high level concept. So if these high level cells exist, the challenge for us is not only to understand how you build up these, these kinds of cells, how you build up these representations, but also think teleologically, like what are they good for? Like why do they exist in the first place? Okay, so uh, subsequently to, to Charles Gross, many people have found face selective cells. Um, David Parrott was one of the uh, main people to, uh, to lead this investigation after uh, Charles Gross, and he summarized 20 years ago with these symbols every location that people had found a face selective cell. So many of these locations are not very precise because people didn't register exactly where they recorded from. Um, but you get the idea that within the inferior temporal cortex, basically everywhere, people have found face selective neurons. And so the idea emerged that these cells are uh, very much distributed amongst uh, other high level selective cells, and that basically face not recognition was the same process. And um, so actually, when I was an undergrad in, in Tübingen, David Parrott uh, gave a talk, and uh, so my impression at the time really was that it's going to be impossible to understand how these face selective cells work because it's very, very difficult to even record from them. So you just got like a very small fraction when you recorded in IT cortex of cells. You would find papers with like thousands of recordings and there's like 20 or 30 recordings of face selective cells. Another thing we didn't know is like how many steps of processing there really are in inferior temporal cortex. You just find these cells located here. We know that early vision is here. We know that early vision starts in B1, then there's B2, B3, B4, so there are multiple areas we can give a name to. But once you're in fear temporal cortex, it seems to be like a big swath of, uh, of cortex. It seems like an association cortex with not much structure to it. And uh, so we didn't know, maybe there's a hierarchy, but we didn't even know like how many steps this, this hierarchy would have for processing. Okay, and then uh, we got the, the main clue from, from Nancy's work uh, when she discovered face like the cells, which I'm sure that you're all familiar with right now, that maybe there is an organization to the system that we just missed in the, the macaque monkey. And this could be a reflection, maybe a point that, uh, that Matt raised earlier before about the method that you use for your investigation. If you're doing a single unit recordings that are not targeted, you might be missing an overall picture of organization just by 
you being focused on very minute detail on single cells and you don't see the overall organization. If you use a technique like fMRI, you can't know the very minute uh, organization because your resolution is not high enough, but you do get a pretty much accurate picture of the overall organization. You can find things like face selective areas. The drawback of the method is you don't really know like how face selective the areas are. These are actually significance maps which are thresholded, so you see that there are regions that are more face selective than others and they're significantly face selective, so significantly more responding to faces than non-face objects, but you don't know how many cells in these regions really are face selective. It could just be, you know, like a slight percentage higher than the outside of the face areas. And um, so, so the question that we then asked, are these face areas really domain-specific modules? Um, my uh, information about this course tells me that this was already a subject of uh, discussion. This is why I also raised this, uh, this question. So are these modules or is it just like an iceberg effect? You have slightly more face like cells here. And so the other question is if you have this data from single cell recordings, do monkeys also have these uh, organizations into face like areas? And, um, or are they just distributed cells? And then once you know these areas, can you associate different functions to these two different areas? And those were the questions that uh, Doris found I asked some 10, 12 years ago. And the way we addressed this is shown here. So we used fMRI just as in humans. Uh, we had like a horizontal chair that fits exactly into the board. And, uh, the monkey would be sitting there in a couch position. And then we would show pictures of faces, human faces, monkey faces, pictures of bodies, uh, other things, uh, hands as biological controls, and then run a big t-test over the uh, entire brain to look for areas that respond more to faces than to non-face objects. And what we found was very consistently across monkeys that there are six regions in the temporal lobe that respond more to human or monkey faces than, than to non-face objects. And <clears throat> we can actually give names to them, which I'm not showing here, but uh, the anatomical location is reproducible enough that we can give them names based on the anatomical location. So, and then I wanted to highlight, so Bevel Conway did a very nice paper uh, last year coming out where I looked for color selectivity in inferior temporal cortex, and actually found that there Wherever there is a face area, there's a nearby color selective module as well. And so if you put this information together and the information that Marge had that she might have discussed when she trains animals uh, on numerosity tasks early, early enough in life, they will develop also small areas in the brain that are selected for these modules and they also seem to be organized uh, sort of very closely to the face areas. They don't overlap, but they're very nearby to the face areas. So just in, in metal stuff, I've seen yeah. three regions that you said yeah. six. Are those, is that the, the anterior, posterior, middle, anterior, and it's like a different, different yeah. level or something? Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. So we have, actually, so we have like four levels of processing. I don't know if Jim talked about this. This might be an eye selective region. So we would then have three regions, but there is a color region here as well. Those are the, but, but like, from and then we have three things. He likes to be together those two middle ones. And the yeah. Two so we, so he would have like an, a color area here, here, and he, oh, this one here you can't, ones, you right. can't just see. And then these areas, uh, that's something special for faces most likely. Uh, that the two levels of processing here have like a, a counterpart that's deeper inside the STS, inside the sockets. But in terms of the anterior to posterior gradients, we have these different levels, actually, uh, uh, where you also have. So yes, this one here close to PL, and then this one here, this one here. And um, the one close to M would be this one here, which you can't see in the side view here. Okay, so, so there might be an overall, there's likely an overall organization to the inferior temporal cortex uh, with areas, and it might be that sort of the, the phobia of your object vision is faces because this is what you're particularly good at, and that everything else is organized around. Okay. So, you mentioned Marge's work where she gets the uh, variable that's like trained on arbitrary symbols and like yeah. specific areas. She only gets one area, right? She doesn't get like three. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit variable across animals. Was actually looking this up yesterday again. Uh, so I think she had, in the original paper, she had like three different monkeys. Maybe she has more now. And uh, if you look where they are, there, there's typically this one area that I think is, um, is uh, closest to these middle areas here. Um, but there, there were oftentimes there are two or three areas which can also be more anterior. So, and do they kind of line up with the face areas? They so they're very close to the face area. So, so there's a big debate about whether um, whether face selectivity is sort of genuine face selectivity or just expertise with uh, high level uh, visual content, and then there are further differentiations there. Um, and so Marge's result would indicate that maybe the overall areas are particularly good learning things, but the face areas are separate from other high level uh, content. Yeah, but, but does, is, does there seem to be like a yoking, like like what was cool about Rose's paper was that you have like the, it seems like these things are right next to each other, it's just yeah. there might be like the three chunks of IT 
Yeah. Did margin areas kind of land consistent with that story or not really? Yeah, so I see, so, so the way I see this in the three animals that she has is that typically there's one area here, yeah. and then sometimes I see also something here, and again, this, this area is hard to image. It's like uh, where we have lower things to noise ratio, so I don't think she's seen anything there, um, which is actually interesting uh, that she does not. <coughs> Okay, so if you have these, FM, so, so we have <coughs> fMRI localized space areas. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, in the stimuli, I noticed that they use some kind of round shape, like clock and yeah. like orange. Because um, Marge told us something about recent work from Roger to Tao's lab. Basically, yeah. the FSA also respond to curvature pretty robustly. So I wonder, is that the reason that you use round shape object to get rid of the low level image statistics? Yeah, so. Yeah, so we used, yeah, this was one of the reasons I'm going to show you some data that actually speaks uh, to that directly. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to have control stimuli that, that mimic phases uh, and some properties like around this. And so technological objects don't do it. Uh, biological controls like hands, body shapes are not very good for that. And so we had like roundish uh, fruits and vegetables for that control. Okay, so now the question is, are these domain-specific modules, like how phase-selective are these regions really? And to test this, we then introduced electrodes into these areas and initially targeted the middle phase patches for recordings and um, showed the same stimuli that was used for fMRI. And I'm going to show you one recording, which is actually the, the first cell we recorded in this area. You're going to see a video that we took from the control monitor. It shows the same thing the monkey saw at the time of the recording. In addition, you're going to see this black square, which is indicating where he's looking at, and he did not see that. And the clicks that I hope you're going to hear, they're going to indicate when the cell fired an action potential. Yeah. Okay, now well, this doesn't work. So I hope you can uh, convince yourself that everything, every time there's a phase shown, the cell responds. Uh, this is the response vector of the cell that we can extract from these responses. We have 96 different stimuli, the six different phases on the left-hand side, the other objects on the right-hand side. We normalize the response magnitude, and you can see the cells responding mostly to the six different phases, but there are some intermediate responses to some of the non-phase stimuli. We can color code these, uh, red indicating response enhancement, blue indicating response suppression. Uh, what this color coding allows us is now to stack response vectors of all the cells that we record from these areas on top of each other and get a population response matrix. So here, cell number runs from top to bottom, stimulus number from left to right. All these lines here are these uh, single cell population response vectors. And there are several things that I think you can see at a glance. Uh, so one thing is that, well, for the 16 phases here, there's a lot of redness over here, which indicates that most of the cells really are enhanced in their response selectively to phases. There's a smaller population of cells that are selectively suppressed. And then there's an interim population here for which it's not clear what they prefer, but for some 85% of the cells upwards, they really like to respond to phases. But you can also see if you average the responses across all these different cells, is again, the dominance for phases, but you can also see that there are some stimuli here, these orange stripes that are running down, some non-phase stimuli that are eliciting intermediate responses. And if you look which stimuli these are, these are clock phases, apples, uh, you know, sliced tomatoes, so things that have things in common with phases. So if they're roundish, if there's some internal structure in there, maybe if they're symmetric, these are all good cues already for these cells to respond. Not quite as good as for phases, but they have a partial response. So um, if we think this area that we're recording from might be homologous to the FFA, then maybe this is part of the reason why you might get a uh, response in the FFA as well. Okay, so virtually all the cells in the middle phase patches are, yeah. are phased. Question. I'm sorry, I should, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm sorry, we're back to the question. question okay. line up to me first. Um, in the more anterior regions, is there less response to these round non-phase objects? Yeah, so we did a decoding, so even, I don't know, uh, so even Tommy's lab was decoding some, you know, some data uh, for us. Mm -hmm. And it's in the most anterior area, yes. Um, uh, so there's less information about this. Uh, in the middle area, there's more anterior to this one here. Uh, it's not so clear, so there might, be, might not be less, but in the more interior, there's less. Less response. Less response, sorry, to, to the non-phase 
non-phase stimuli, even even those string properties like uh, like randomness. The question I was wondering about was like this shows very nicely how many phase cells you have inside the phase patches. We have a sense of how many phase cells are outside of the phase patches for in other parts of IP. Yeah, so we have not measured this extensively. There's uh, work from Move and Focals. Uh, we've done this actually. Uh, Jim DiCarlo uh, just studied this uh, one one um, postdoc in his lab. Just studied this extensively, and they basically just by recording. Once you know that the phase cells are there, and you go very systematic through the entire brain, you find them just based on electrophysiology. So the fractions that were reported prior to the phase errors were up to 20, 30 percent. Typically, it's on the order of like five percent. Then the question is, okay, what do you call a phase cell? And uh, so I'm I'm circumventing this problem here right now by just you know telling you loosely, you know, these cells are responding more to the existing phases than the non-phase optics. We can quantify this by some kind of index and say that they are phase selectors. So we can formalize that. But what about a cell that only likes one out of a thousand faces and doesn't like anything else, it's going to be harder to define what makes the cell phase select. And also, if you have a cell that's responding some more to phases than all other control objects, it might not be truly uh, phase selective. So one indicator that's coming up now, and this is uh, work that um, Open Focus has done, is he was recording from cells inside and outside the phase areas, and uh, he was looking for cells that responded more to phases than to non-phase objects inside and outside the phase areas. And now if you invert the phase upside down, there's a qualitative difference between cells inside the phase areas and the ones outside. So the ones inside, they are really inhibited a lot, or the response is it's, it's not increased as much by phases anymore once you invert the phase upside down. Uh, but for the cells outside, they don't really care very much for this inversion. And phase inversion, maybe Nancy told you, is like one of the hallmarks of, of uh, human phase recognition. So even though something might look like it's a phase selective uh, in different regions, it, might have quite a different, different properties if you look at this more closely. Mm -hmm. So how does the, um, <coughs> as you rotate the phase from the yeah. position, right, how, how much does the, the uh, does the response like fall off? Is it, is it pretty fast or, I, I assume we rotate a little tiny bit, I can still tell the phase, right, but if it's upside down, it's way different. So yeah. what does the response curve kind of look like? So we have not measured this for these cells. I'm going to show you one example cell, but I can't promise this. Um, but I might show you one example cell uh, from another phase area. It's going to answer that. But uh, if I don't get to it, you can ask me later, and I can show it to you. I have a quick question. So when you say uh, when you rotate the phase upside down, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if any people try the control condition where they just like this in developmental study put three dots, like the top heavy configuration yeah. or. Yeah. Uh, this would be great. So, so we have not done that, um, uh, and I don't know of anyone who has done it, but I think it would be a very nice thing to do. Um, yeah, so developmentally you can find, uh, it can be disheartening to mothers that their, their children might be looking, you know, smiling at objects that are just like three dots, like two at the top and one at the bottom. Um, and if you invert them, then there's a response is gone, and so you might find something similar in, in space cells as well. Okay, so we find virtually all the cells to be phase selective. Um, they, res they respond to non-phase objects which have little features with phases. Um, so we think that the phase patches really are dedicated phase processing modules, and it would be like one case where modularity exists. And we think what the cells in this area are doing is to detect phases. They respond very radically to the presence of a phase, um, and they do this via shape analysis. Okay, so. Um, uh, Nancy, as you warned me years ago when I gave a talk about this work, not to mention the, the word modularity, because it was going to get a lot of um, heated responses uh, to the term. And it's actually not, not really happened. Um, but uh, when I was about to talk at Vanderbilt uh, University, I thought, okay, so now I really have to uh, wonder about this because uh, someone who's really very much against this idea of modularity is at Vanderbilt. And so I looked at what, what does the term modularity actually mean. Uh, so Marion Webster says it's a module, it's a noun, it's an independently operable unit. It is part of the total structure of the space vehicle. Okay, so this is good. Um, so you know all this. Um, um, but what we are referring to as a module really is based on Andre Fodor's uh, seminar book, The Modularity of Mind. And as you can tell from the title, he had like a very radical idea about, you know, that this is like the way the mind works. And so there are a lot of properties, you know, domain specificity, for example, uh, that, that come along as sort of like, like baggage with this term modularity. So domain specificity means that the modules only operate on a certain kind of input, so they're specialized. Information is encapsulated, so it's not accessible to the outside. Um, the cells there, the, the modules active obligatorily when a certain uh, input stimulus happens. One of the advantages is you can have fast speed. 
maybe that's related to the question about what face recognition has to do with intelligence. It might be kind of sort of inbuilt fast intelligence. Um, the outputs are shallow, accessibility is limited, uh, there's a characteristic in an ontogeny, and there's a fixed neural architecture. And I think that um, a lot of these criteria we don't have evidence for exactly for, for these regions. Um, like information encapsulation, I think it's, it's something that is partly true. Um, at the borders of the face patches, um, there's likely a gradient uh, there. And I don't think that if you talk about a module that you have to take literally all these properties here uh, of the module because we haven't proven all of them. But on the other hand, I think there's something very, um, there's a lot of virtue using this, this word because you have these areas uh, which in the core are highly, highly face selective and we find this one animal after the other. Um, and it's uh, it's not, you know, it's like when we start recording in the lab, just like um, a week ago, we were starting, we were recording from these areas, we find these face selective cells and this is sort of the, the, the prime property. So there are other properties to it, but the, the number one thing that, that, that it's not a subtle phenomenon. This is just the way it is. It's that, that virtually all the cells in these regions are face select. Okay. So one thing I wanted to briefly mention is um, now if you yeah are you, are you are you moving on to modularity? Yeah, but I can go back. Well, I just want so to let's have which is um, it, it was really interesting to see the contrast with you know the, the sort of the, the rocket ship design and and Fodor, right? Because I think I mean Fodor is a, is very because he's very smart. He had a lot of intelligent things to say about modules, and also, like in his work on language of thought, also that's very influential for <coughs> people like me. But it's also the case that he's not really an engineer, and he didn't have the benefit of a lot of the engineering background that we have now. And I really actually think, you know, a lot of the controversy over modularity has been, I think, unfortunate because every engineer knows that some kind of modularity is is sort of essential in any complex system. Yeah. There's just no existing engineer system that doesn't have some kind of notion of modules. And, and, I, and, and, I, and I think it's, it would, it would, it, in general, it would just be very interesting for people in this group to try to rethink what we mean by modularity, not so much along the lines of one very, very smart person who's kind of in, you know, it's, it, all of these are sort of engineering type considerations, but they're not necessarily really thinking about how you really build a system that actually works in engineering terms. Right. Um, anyway. Okay, so we should then follow Justin's advice and sort of, you know, well, I mean, I, I, I just see it, 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 you know, somewhere in between, like the kind of thinking that you use yeah. to build a complex robotic adaptive system, which yeah. has to do with you know, error after engineering, but more like computer science. Right, right. So let's let's put some some modular units for the mind. Can I just add to that? I, I think these are important insights, but I just want to note that it's still the case that in human cognitive neuroscience, this is considered fringy, radical, and Tita can tell you, right? Right? The notion of modularity. The notion of yeah, modularity applied to the human brain is considered fringy, unproven, radical, lunatic. Some, yeah. some of that just is kind of philosophical baggage, right? Like some of you yeah, mean that the, not the, all the, of the Fodorian because, because of the term is associated with with Fodor, the you know, thirty year old idea of Jerry Fodor that wasn't particularly you know, you know what I mean? Like Yes, but just as just as the Fodorian baggage, you know, created some, you know, yeah. interesting space of, of consideration, but also some confusion yeah. in the neuroscience literature. Yeah. The residual yeah. problem is that many people think that the very idea, even yeah. that there is specialization for face processing in the human or macaque, macaque brain, yeah. many yeah. people don't get that but that's just a fact. Right? We can talk uh -huh. about what it means and how all these other issues play out, but the idea that that's just simply a fact at this point yeah. is not accepted, astonishingly, I think. Do you think if, 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 if you hadn't used the word modularity, people would have accepted it more? Well, that's why I suggested that Venra can that he not use it, and that's why I haven't used it since. Yeah. I, so I'm trying to, you know, focus on look, what do we know, what do we not know? We know that there is a, a striking degree of specialization, you know, at the neural level. The rest of it is all up for for discussion, but that fact is clear um, to me and, and, and to anybody who actually looks at the data. <laughs> Uh -huh. I mean, am I being unusual? Can you explain what the concern about modularity is? Sorry? Uh, sorry. Can you explain what the concern about modularity is? Like, what, what's the argument against it? I don't want to hijack Yeah, maybe. No, no, no. Sorry, it's my fault for going into that. No, no, I think it's, it's good. I think it's something to discuss. So the reason I brought it up is uh, that, um, so if you look at the recordings, um, so there's, 
so there's uh, there's going to be a quantitative question it's like how precisely uh, these modules are organized and I think we need two photon imaging uh, of an entire sheet of cortex to really answer this. so we at data when we're going into some of these space areas depending on how they're located we're going through a body selective area first and then we are uh, going from the body selective area into the face area. And then it just takes like one or two neurons that might have joint selectivity to go into the face area. So based on recording data like this um, and others, uh, we are pretty sure that the borders are pretty sharply defined. Um, and then within these borders, then virtually all the cells are face selected. By the way, so the ones that don't look face selective here is because they lack like profile views of faces. If we show profile views, they're gonna be very face selective too. Now we don't know be, uh, for sure because we're using extracellular recordings. There could be lots of cells that are never going to respond in sort of the dark matter of the brain uh, that we don't see, but we would see them if you were patching cells or if we would do like intrinsic Im uh, calcium imaging of cells. We would see all the cells and we would know like if all the cells really are face selected. So right now I can only talk about the cells that fire at least a few spikes to any of our stimuli. And so then it's an empirical question, you know, is there really going to be like a gradient? We would have to know all the dimensions of face processing to know uh, you know, if there are gradients or if there's some kind of structure where there's like a more binary uh, a transition from something that's totally face selective to something that's not face selective at all. So that's sort of like the empirical part. And then, but then there's the whole philosophical part that I would actually very yeah, much like to uh, refer to Nancy to, uh, to comment on. Yeah, I mean, I think to me it's, it's less crucial whether, you know, whether the edges are a little ratty, right? A lot of biological systems have ratty edges. And that doesn't mean that it's a thing, right? So I think that's worth elucidating and it's important, but, but less the essence of the matter. See, the essence of the matter is what I started my lecture with, which is, does it make any sense to talk about the human mind and human brain as composed in any, you know, in any um, uh, substantive way of having components, right, that do different things? If there aren't components, then that's the wrong-headed kind of lever into the system, right? And so. To me, the essence of this is, is, does it really make sense to think that face processing is a, you know, different piece of the system from the rest of object recognition or the rest of the mind, right? And so I think the sense in which there's an intelligent debate on this is that you can go into those face systems when you have neuron level resolution and you can find information about other things than faces. To me, that's the most intelligent counter to the idea of specialization for the face system. And you guys showed in your 2006 paper, I think, that when you when you do a you know a support vector machine on the neural response of the face selective cells, they contain some information about things that aren't faces. It's much less than about faces, but there is some information there. So to me the question, the ultimate resolution of all of this will be with causal tests of the role of each of those parts of the brain in actual behavioral tasks. Yeah, and, and really emphasizing the function of the overall system. That's why the engineering definition is so interesting, right? Like, it doesn't use the word different, right? Like, the, like, the interesting thing about, you know, a, a spaceship is not, is this a different part and that's a different part? I mean, in some sense, right? But it, does it, 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 in some sense, it's operation independent. And what is its role in the total structure and function relationships of the whole system, right? Yeah. So it's a place where computational models will have a key role in the whole system. It's elucidating what we mean by interesting notions of the functional component. Like, I think if we just use the word functional component or something, maybe that would be. Absolutely, and, and of course, the, the classic field of neuropsychology, the study of patients with brain damage, has been doing this for 200 years, going at, I think, exactly that notion of independence, right? You lose one thing and read yeah, other yeah. stuff but, that you can. Right? But it's just in a complex system, independence is complex, right? Anyway. But, yeah. All right, good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we need engineers. <laughs> All right. So, so one one quick uh, thing on the on the side is uh, like if you record from these face cells um, in the middle face patches, they actually have a few to them that you can understand them. They're not that super complicated. So one thing that we did was to Photoshop images as we were recording from a cell, and uh, so we started with like one stimulus that was effective in driving the cell, and then we modified it in different ways, like make it bigger, hide it behind bars, to show like one quadrant of the cell, or turn it upside down to multiple of them and so on and so forth. And what you can see here is that in all the cases when there's at least partial face information, you get a response in the cell. You don't get it in the, in the two images where there's no face in there, and there's no response. But you can also see that a lot of the properties of the, of the response of the cell change. The response latency changes, the intensity changes, the duration changes. The thing that was very consistent was that the response seemed to get longer and longer, the less information about the face that you have. And every time that you're showing the same stimulus, you're getting pretty much the same response. Um, so it, it seems almost like you're, you know, you're showing something to a machine and then it's, it's sort of like cranking along and trying to figure out if there's a face there. 
And if, if you give it less evidence, it takes longer to come up with a solution, but once it, it found the solution, it's going to respond, it's going to tell you there's a phase there. Um, okay, so some monkeys have localized phase errors. The phase errors might be domain-specific modules uh, or functionally specialized units. Um, so, uh, so the next question we ask is we have multiple of them, are they connected to each other? Um, so the reason we asked the question was the phase errors are very far apart from each other, and therefore it might be difficult to wire them up. So you might have an organization where there are six phase errors, but they're not connected to each other. They're mostly operating separately. Or you might have specific connections <laughs> that would group these phase errors into a phase processing network. And the way we addressed this was uh, with microstimulation inside the scanner. Uh, the logic here is that just as you can activate cells in the brain by visual stimuli, you can also activate them by electrical stimulation. So if you place an electrode into your uh, phase selective area and you pass a current through, you're going to activate the cells that in turn is going to change blood flow, blood oxygenation signals you can pick up with the MR scanner, and so you might see a swath of activity around the stimulation site. If these cells that are now activating, if they have projections that are strong and focal enough to drive downstream neurons, then you might also see patches of activation at spatially disjunct locations. And then you can ask if these locations overlap with the phase area. So the, the logic of this experiment is very simple. So you have periods with electrical stimulation, periods without stimulation. There's no visual stimulus shown. It can happen in complete darkness or during sleep. And uh, Sebastian Miller was actually the, uh, the grad student at the time who did these experiments. Uh, these are computer flattened surfaces of the brain with the phase errors, which I'm not going to show by green outlines. And we first targeted the biggest phase error, the middle phase patch. And these images here show the electrode go down, side view on the brain, electrode into the phase area, front view of the brain, electrode going into the phase area. And so this is the simulation side inside the phase patch. And before we did the microstimulation, we recorded from these cells. So this is the response relative to baseline, and you can see again this, uh, these cells respond in a phase selective manner, independently confirming that likely we are inside the phase patches, or inside one phase patch. And now this is the, the activity pattern that we're getting for microstimulation at the site, which is inside the phase area. So we get a swath of activity at the stimulation site, but we get multiple spatially disjunct activations at other regions. And if we now overlay them with the phase areas, you can see that they nicely coincide. So from this experiment, this is just showing that they're really spatially dis disjunct, and so from this we concluded that yes, they are selective connections from this one phase area to the other phase areas. Um, and we can you know, also look at the other hemisphere. If there is activation in the other hemisphere, it's also selectively confined to the phase areas. If we do a control experiment, stimulation outside the phase patch, uh, we don't get phase selective cells. Again, for uh, stimulation, we get a swath of activity around the stimulation side, and then multiple regions that are not, uh, that there are also activated by stimulation here, but now they are so, so they are now inside the phase areas, but they are straddling the organization of the phase patch. So we did this experiment over and over again. I'm not going to label this, this uh, experimental point so much, but whenever we do the experiment stimulating here, again we find activations that are overlapping with the phase areas. And so from all these experiments together, we concluded that yes, these phase areas are part of a phase processing network. In fact, we now have uh, retrograde labeling uh, data that show that 90% of all the cells that you're labeling inside the phase area, if you look where, they are, um, where their cell bodies are located, they're located inside the phase uh, processing system. So it's a very surprisingly close system uh, where the different phase areas are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Are they necessarily directly connected? Yeah, so from this experiment, we don't know for sure. Um, usually in quadis, if you have a forward projection, you also have a feedback projection that, that tends to be a little less precise. Um, but from this technique, you wouldn't necessarily know which direction they go. But can you tell about the direction, like the that you have from the top one down to the bottom one? Yeah. Can you tell that that's independent from going through the two stop, like the one stop on the flight? Yeah. Direct oh, what's, what's, okay. So, um, so strictly speaking, we don't know this either. So it would be possible if you, if you stimulate here, get activation here, this passing through this area here. Um, and so only because you're activating these cells, then they get in the downstream areas. So we would argue by the strength of activation that you're seeing uh, to this that it's not clearly getting weaker and weaker as you would see if you would go through one station and then the other. Um, but directly we only see this now with the retrograde phase of studies that you can go through multiple levels. Sorry, say that again. Can the retrograde ones go across? No, so these are like ones that would just go to the SOMA. So they picked up by the synapse and they go to the SOMA and then you know it's a direct connection. So the way cortex works is that it's, it's, it can just like, be passing through here. It would be possible that you get activation here, and then just because these cells are active, then you also get these ones active. And so whenever we draw a direct connection here, we might not really know. Um, if you look at the data and look like how strong the activation is, it's, it's unlikely that we can't pull this up. 
Okay, and then uh, because I think because Facebook has a special social status, it might also not be so surprising that this network then has particular connections uh, to other outside face areas. So in particular, this most anterior area, AM, has a projection to the lateral amygdala, which is part of the emotional brain, um, where there are also face vector -like cells found. And this is one of the outputs. Then we also have a projection from one other area to the pulvinar, and um, from the pulvinar into the frontal eye fields. And so these are the connections that we currently know that are the strongest ones. We actually know a couple more to the claustrum, uh, for example, but uh, there's a very strong output uh, to the amygdala, and then indirectly to the frontal eye fields, which are controlling attention. And so you could imagine that maybe these are the links that are mediating the processes that faces exert on, uh, on emotional responses or on cognitive responses, like orienting attention to a face or following gates. Um, maybe also briefly I should mention that there are three uh, face selective areas in prefrontal cortex, one in the orbital face, uh, orbital, um, frontal cortex, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, arcuate face patch. They are all very face selective, so the time courses here show in green epochs uh, responses to faces and in orange epochs responses to non-faces. And you can see they're very, very face selective too. And uh, we also know that they are connected to the to this temporal face patch. So these are all the connections that we know of right now. There might be additional uh, connections to these frontal uh, areas but this is only showing the connections that we know. And do you, are the frontal ones as reliable across one piece as the more like temporal lobe ones? The prefrontal ones? Yeah, the prefrontal ones. Um, so the orbital frontal one we also see in, in, uh, in all the animals. The latter ones, they are a bit more finicky. Uh, so we don't always see them. Uh, and this uh, PV, for example, uh, seems to occur at two different locations. So it might actually be two areas, and sometimes we see one and the other. Uh, we haven't done many recordings in there yet, so we also don't know what the functional properties are. So once we would know this, then I think we'd be more sure what exactly the nature is. Um, but we see them in like half the animals upwards. So if we don't see them, it stands to reason that it might be for technical reasons that we don't see them in particular, uh, particular experiments, and that they don't necessarily exist. I think that's true in humans, too, the frontal yeah. face stuff. We see those, you know, like nice, robust frontal you know, selective front face responses in frontal lobes in about half of the subjects and not the other half yeah. of those slides. So in, in general, I mean, so this is only for experiments where you find like static faces compared to static content. It's an easy and human face area to see them for dynamic faces, for example, and so I'm quite sure, like with the monkeys, I think they're much more easily engaged by the stimuli we're showing to them. And uh, so this is, I think, where it might be a little easier for us to activate prefrontal cortex because, you know, they don't watch movies every day, you know, something's happening there. And if we are, you know, making the stimuli more interesting, like in the social scenes I, I was showing initially, then actually we see these areas active much more easily. So likely they are face selective, but likely they're doing something more than, than just faces. Yeah, I was going to make the same point is that we see them in like, it's very variable in humans as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I, it might have been Decimal, and I'm not sure, had a paper saying that it might be like object-based attention. So when you're attending to a face, then it lights up more consistently. That's yeah, period, yeah. So you said she's going to talk this afternoon. You might talk about some more. So there's, uh, she's a region now in, in human, uh, in Cortison, but there's also some work in, in monkeys in a region that might be overlapping with PV. And it seems to be involved, I would say, in non spatial forms of attention uh, that might include object and uh, feature based attention. Um, and yeah, so there could be a link to attention networks here as well that, that faces maybe ought to be engaged as uh, this network. Okay, so uh, I have like a few more minutes, uh, so I would like to make like one more point. So I raised the question initially as a, as a problem. So can we figure out like how face cells work, how they're wired? And uh, another way of looking at this is to ask if we have these multiple face areas, what are the functional specializations in these regions? So we, I showed you recordings from this area here. And I'm going to show recordings from these two areas here. And uh, we first repeat the same experiment we did before. So we're showing these uh, stimuli with faces in front view on the left and the multiple non-face stimuli here. This is again for the middle face patch, very face selective. We find 94% of the cells uh, that are face selective. Um, and now in AL, the second area, again, you can see a concentration of cells that respond to faces here, but there are lots of cells that are actually inhibited by faces. And so in the overall population response, you see that actually this population is a little less face selective than the middle face patch. So we were actually quite disappointed by this initially and uh, were puzzled because we asked me, like, how is it conceivable that the inputs to a lip, which is from the middle face patches predominantly, how can they be so face selective and then leave the output area, AL, a lip, uh, less face selective than the inputs? And the answer to the puzzle became clear when we, lose, when we use somewhat different stimuli. So we showed a stimulus set with 25 different faces, showing from left to right, 
and then eight different head orientations from top to bottom. And now the response matrix is shown here. Again, cell number runs from top to bottom, stimulus number from left to right. And these stimuli are uh, organized coarsely by head orientation. So the first 25 images are left profiles and left half profiles, front views, right half profiles, right profiles. And within the fine grain information is about the, the face identity. So stimulus number 1, 26, 51, these are the same identity, different head orientations. And uh, this is, again, our screening set with the front view faces shown on the left and objects, but sorted in the same way by, by um, cell number from top to bottom. And what you can see here is that there are some cells which we plot at the bottom. They respond to the front view of the face, also the face looking upwards or downwards. And these were predominantly face selective. But at the top, we have a very peculiar population of cells that are responding to profile views. And if these cells respond to one profile view, the left profile, they actually are always responding to the right profile, and we only find these cells in this particular region. They can be suppressed by front views of faces. And because in our screening set, we only showed front views of faces, they didn't appear as very face selective. So depending on the definition of what a face selective cell is, I would say these are very, very face selective cells, but they're not going to respond to front views of faces, but to profiles very selectively. But the cool thing is that this confusion of left and right symmetry, and I don't know if Tommy is going to talk about this later on in the course, um, so there are some very, very, to me, very satisfying uh, theoretical insights now that is following from a new theory that he has developed in object recognition that actually can explain why this mirror symmetry can occur at this level. But I'm just going to set it as a fact uh, for now. So I would like to show one example cell to you. I think you can hear it really likes a profile view. It doesn't care so much which person is shown. It doesn't care if it's a left view or a right view. But it really likes a profile view of a face. Is this the, the, help the, the actual presentation speed of the... Yeah. yeah. So that they can be very fast. So sometimes people are asking, you know, I don't even see the stimulus, but the cells will, will, will see the face stimuli. So because we find this in all the animals, always at the stage, you know, it's good to reason that this is like an essential property of this area, but we had no explanation, and now with Tommy's theory, we actually have an explanation for it. Okay, I'm going to jump over the fine details. What about AM? It's the top level. It's the, uh, the area that's um, projecting to the amygdala. Again, overall, the population, the, the cells appear less face selective than the input cell uh, level, and uh, the, there was a... Um, Again, to the stimulus set with 25 individuals at eight different head orientations, uh, you can see that this looks very different now from the input level where we have this mirror symmetry. So we have some cells that we're putting at the bottom that are responding to virtually all the faces. So they don't care which individual is there. They don't care if it's a left or right view. They also don't care if it's a small face or a big face um, at this position or at that position, which is not shown here. Uh, and then there are like some cells which are very, very uh, selective, which are shown here at the top. And uh, I'm going to show one of these cells to you and maybe you can figure out what, what the cell is interested in. Any guesses? Hmm? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's one person there, it's a blonde, it's a blonde boy that the monkey has never seen in real life. This one. And this is the, this is the stimulus the cell likes. So it has a graded response. It likes the front view a bit better than like side views, but it's almost only spiking if this one particular individual comes up. Okay, so we have these three different levels of processing, and this is, I think, why it's not possible, because of the modular architecture, because you can record from face cells day after day after day, so we can really determine the computational processes. Uh, because there are these different levels of processing that we know are connected to each other, we can know something about the inputs of the face selective cells and then can start to build models about like how they acquire their properties and actually test experimentally how they acquire their properties. And these properties are transformed in qualitatively different ways from one level of processing. So you have like a very picture-based presentation at the front level, the cells more like a front view or a side view, but only one view. Then you have this combination of views in the next level across the symmetry axis, and then you have this almost viewing variant representation at the, at the top level. Okay, and um, since it's 12 o'clock, I'm going to be jumping over uh, a lot of stuff here. Um, 
but I'm going to be around, so if you have any questions, um, you can ask me. And um, so I don't have control over the uh, the computer, so otherwise it would jump more. Um, okay. So what I was showing you is, if you look at the mechanic brain, um, you can actually have a, a much better view of the mechanic brain if you use an MR scanner and do a functional magnetic resonance imaging experiment where you can then like, locate face selective areas. And you can do this for other functional properties as well. So Pablo, um, who's in the course of the red in my lab, he's been using this um, for attention studies. So you can localize components of attention networks. And we're also looking now at uh, social processing networks and networks that are social communication, emotional responses. So it's a very, very useful tool to, um, to make a problem that seems untractable, tractable. So again, like David Parrott said, it was very difficult to find face selective cells. It seemed impossible to figure out how these cells are wired up to, to become face selective. I think now the problem is tractable and this is possible because of fMRI. In combination with electrophysiology, you can then record from these areas, figure out that they are modules. You can microstimulate to figure out what they're connected to. You can see these are in networks, but you can do this for any function. Um, you can now figure out and know how many levels of processing there really are. Um, and you can figure out what the, process, what the properties are of cells at the top level. So you can even, in a, in a Morian way of analyzing the system, you can now ask what are the computational goals of the system, what are the, the, the uh, properties it wants to derive. Then you can ask what are the algorithms by which they implement it, and then neurally how they are uh, coded in the real world hardware. And then you can ask questions deep into the social brain, like how can you use this information now to recognize a person that you know how to activate social knowledge, how to activate emotions, how to activate attention systems. And, um, so does it have to do anything with intelligence? I don't know the answer. Um, this is sort of like one partial view on this. It's like you, you're seeing faces everywhere, right? It's like our cognitive or perceptual uh, hardwired face in priors that we have looking into the world. We want to see faces and want to recognize them. And so maybe in this way, you know, Josh, I don't know if you talked about recognition models or other cognitive architectures. It might be like, like just like one snippet of how our minds are, you know, pre-wired with certain structures that I'm posing about onto the uh, incoming information that's happening this way, and that might be a building block of intelligence. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Do we sort of questions or is this test? I'm not afraid of questions. You can ask me questions, but I don't want. Let's, let's, I know that uh, I'm. Let's get uh, one or two quick questions, and then Vinders will be around for questions, uh, and then we'll have a group picture, and, and we'll make sure that we we'll have lunch as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two quick questions or one. Not, not yeah. Quick question. Um, I wonder if so. If you look from a per, um, developmental perspective, yeah. are those face patches start from the beginning? They are there, or how is it connected? Through the yes, I think it's a super important question. As you can imagine, it's going to be very difficult to study. There was a poster briefly four or five years ago at Neuroscience from a Japanese group that had studied um, the development of time course behaviorally very, very thoroughly. And they had shown a face like this area in a very young animal. And uh, Marge might have told you that she's studying this, this question now. Um, but I don't know that there's a definitive answer. I think it's going to be super important to know uh, if they are there because I showed you this little three-day-old macaque monkeys oriented to faces. There's something there about face recognition would be so nice to know, but uh, I don't think we, we do it. Uh, I have a question about decoders or algorithms that might use um, responses to faces. Yeah. That would be very different from, I, I like the last slide about the face tuning curve. Do you think those uh, decoders that uh, use responses from face to selective cells would be very different from um, responses for natural scenes or like, ratings? Um. My hunch is yes, but I don't know because I'm so <laughs> like face sensor. That I can tell you some stories where we know that the cells are doing. So it's like you know measuring facial features, but also being selected for course facial features that help you to detect the face. And uh, so, so we know more and more about these cells. But um, and my assumption would be because face recognition is more holistic, and because I mean you know that you're going to have to process faces as opposed to other structures. So that there might be differences between those cells and others. But I think this is going to be I think I can't really say this definitively right now because we haven't really studied. But the problem is with all other, other cells that you're going to be studying is you don't really know what they're processing, right? So if you find like a cell that is responding well to particular stimulus, you can say, okay, it's making some contribution to encoding that stimulus, but do you really know that this is the right kind of stimulus to start? 
then if you start analyzing what are the critical features, are you really you know, at the response optimum of the sale and you really thinking about like, what the sale likes or are you somewhere else and you're sort of seeing like a shadow of what, what the real sale likes. So if there are any differences, it's going to be very difficult methodologically to, to know exactly you know, what, what they have in common, what they don't have. So you, you focus on the part of the, of the presentation that you got to show us on two very important dimensions of variability, face and identity and pose. Yeah. What about emotional expression? Yeah. You so, we, that uh, so we're only starting to look at this now. Uh, the reason we haven't done this so far is that we felt we have to have monkey face expressions to get this right. And uh, are we sure that monkeys won't have the right responses to yeah, so we are sure. Uh, so if you smile at the monkey, they're going to do this an aggressive gesture. So you can say, well, they understand human emotions just that they get the meaning wrong. So for the face processing part, it might be okay, but we felt we had to get the monkey face expressions. Um, and um, uh, so far, we don't have. So we, we do find some cells that are selected for it, but we don't know that it's uh, going to be selective across different individuals. So, so there is some sensitivity, like an open mouth, for example, with, with big teeth. It can be like a very strong stimulus and face like the cell. Um, but we don't know yet whether this is like a specific uh, dimension that is independent of identity uh, versus it's like a low-level feature. I think so. Uh, so within a year or so, we, we know the answer. We know.